We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a do-it-yourself blog, YouTube channel, and podcast that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 111 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. (laughs) What's up? This is the perfect weekend to be talking about this next topic. We are talking about thrift stores. I really wanted to publish my podcast before Earth Day, but you know, life just gets in the way and it just doesn't happen. I've been so busy with gardening projects. I just didn't have time to do it, but I felt we're still going to talk about it because I feel like Earth Day has to be something that we mind, that we're mindful of every day of the year. It's not just one day of the year. And you know, here at Thrift Diving, we love thrift stores. We love repurposing. I think we probably are more environmentally conscious than a lot of other people or at least I I would like to think so. (laughs) We love to repurpose and, you know, we see ugly things that other people want to throw out and we know it could look better and we paint it and refinish it and put it in our homes. At least that's what I do. Anyway, today we're going to talk about 10 things that you must know before you hit the thrift store. Now, if you are an avid thrifter, you may know a lot of this stuff. Maybe there's a tip or two that you hear that you just didn't know or didn't realize. And so we're going to talk about all these things today. And I say here at Thrift Diving, we love thrift stores. I love thrift stores. I think if you're listening to this, you probably love thrift stores. But there are some people who are bargain shoppers who don't like to go to thrift stores. They are so afraid of what they're going to bring home with that piece of furniture (laughs) or with that piece of clothing that they won't shop thrift stores. They'll go to other bargain bargain, uh, shopping places like, you know, Ross or, you know, there's people that have been telling me lately they love Temu, T-E-M-U. I've been seeing them advertised everywhere. I've gone to their site, but I've not actually shopped there. And this is not sponsored by them in any way. But some of the women, a couple of the women who are in my, the the next round of money makeover challenges uh, that we're, we're, we're doing right now, two of the challengers said, we love shopping there. We don't like thrift stores because we don't want to bring home bugs, but we love shopping there. And so there might be some people out there, you might be listening to this, that you you like bargains, but you are just sort of like, "Eh, I don't know if I really want to shop thrift stores or I don't shop them that often. These tips are going to help you. And you may even hear some tips that you possibly didn't even think of, right? Even if, even if you love thrift stores, you may not have thought about this. Okay, so let's just jump into these. And then at the end, I will say a little something about Earth Day. Because I have a few thoughts that I've been trying to... I've been re-recording this, actually, the last 15 minutes. Because I've been trying to get out my thoughts on Earth Day. And some of the things that we can do. And does it really make a difference? Okay, before I get into that, <laughs> let's jump into talking about what are some of these things that you must know before you hit the thrift store. And I'll just preface this by saying, I love thrift stores. In fact, my entire house, I would say probably 97.5% of my house, everything has come from the thrift store. The only thing that I can tell you right now that has not come from the thrift store is my sofa. And I just got that probably about a year and a half ago. I bought that brand new, but previously my sofa was not a thrifted sofa, but I had it for 18 years and it was time. I mean, it had, I mean, it had gone through three children. So you can imagine everything that was embedded on that sofa. It was just, (laughs) it was in bad shape. So our sofa, our bed and our mattress. And that's pretty much it. Even the kids, well, the kids mattresses, of course, I would never buy a mattress at the thrift store, but my oldest son, his bed was a hand-me-down and my other two sons, I built their beds. And where did I find their headboards? At the thrift store. So I'll leave a link down below if you want to check out their beds. Super cool with these vintage headboards. I love them. So my home has come from the thrift store. And even over the years, as I've made more money, considering where I was when we first bought this home, I I was at a much, I would say my earning power was much lower than it is now. Probably three or four times. No, not four. But 
I make a lot more money now than I did when I first started out. So going to thrift stores, it was always a passion of mine, but it, it also was a necessity. I had to go to the, to the thrift store because I couldn't afford to, to go from a two bedroom condo into a four bedroom home, which was like twice as much space and not go into credit card debt. I didn't want to go into credit card debt. And not just that, but the things that you get from the thrift store are just so much better quality than the stuff that you can buy at the store. You know, if you go to Ikea, and I know Ikea is on the lower end, a lot of stuff there is just particle board. Of course, they've got some wood. They've got some pine. Our bedroom furniture, can't believe this, but our bedroom furniture lasted 14 years, <laughs> which is insane. I mean, it did fall down and break and we had to patch that baby back together. But even though it was wood, it was still a cheaper wood. It was cheaply made. And the stuff that I get from the thrift store, it's just better quality. And you're not going to find that kind of quality today. And if you do, you're going to pay a lot of money for it. So that's why I always tell people, go to thrift stores, find, you know, have that be the first place that you go, right? Thrift stores should be number one. When you're looking for something like a dresser, a desk, maybe a dining room table. You can go to the thrift store. You can go to the restore. I love the Habitat for Humanity restores. We talked about that in a recent episode. The Habitat stores, at least in this area and the Washington, D.C. area, or let me just say Montgomery County, those stores had brought in $400,000 over the last year. And that goes to fund the homes that they use to build for low-income people that are looking to buy their first home. So I'm all for supporting their missions and, you know, the, the the money that some of these thrift stores contribute back into the community, I'm all for it. And I feel that that should be the first place that you go to look for what you, what you need. If you can't find it at the thrift store, sometimes you won't, then maybe go to like Ikea, you can go to Ross, sometimes there's furniture, you know, small furniture at Ross and other places, but Hands down, thrift stores should be the number one place that you go to. But before you go, what are the things that you have to know before you go? And my first tip of what you should know is that you have to know what's valuable and you have to know what's junk. And I can't tell you how many times I've stood in the middle of a thrift store with my phone out, Googling something that I found and just trying to figure out, was well, is this really worth it? I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to know if something is really just a deal, or if it really is valuable. And I think, you know, when you're looking at places like eBay, um, auction homes, sometimes you can find some of these online auctions, and you can see what something has sold for that can give you an idea of whether something is valuable. But sometimes you just don't know. And I think in that case, sometimes you have to have a little bit more experience at knowing what are considered valuable pieces of furniture. So in my first tip, I do, and I'm going to link to the blog post here, there is a free book that you can download that actually has some tips on what to look for, how you know something is valuable. I did a collaboration a few years ago with, oh gosh, and I can't remember the name of the place. Um, it's kind of slipping my mind right now, but they had provided me this free ebook where you could go in and figure out, okay, is it a print or a painting? Like, let's say you're looking for wall art. Do you know if it's a real painting or is it just a print? Is it an oil based paint or is it acrylic? And, you know, when you're looking at silver, let's say you're trying to buy some things for your dining room, right? Or even if you just find some silver pieces, how do you know that's even valuable? You know, there's a, there's a site that I love to follow. And I think I talked about this before. It's a local auction place. And maybe about once a month, they'll do an online auction. And I saw pieces of silver that were going for like $500, $600. I think it was even more. It was like a whole set for like maybe $1,500. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, are people really paying this amount of money for silver? <laughs> but just in looking at it, it just looked like some forks and knives to me. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know. Um, but this booklet, and you'll see in this email, you can click, or this blog post, you can click the link and you can download the free book. But um, it will talk to you about furniture and rugs and jewelry and tools, uh, modern pieces. And it's about a 50-page book. 
Oh, Max Sold. That's the company, Max Sold, M A X S O L D. And the man who owns it, it's a really cool guy named Sushi. He and I had collaborated. And so he said, Yeah, we've got this free book. If you want to give this to your to your readers, it's called The Essential Guide in Downsizing and Estate Sales. Sort of like what to look for, what's valuable. And I would recommend downloading this 50 pages of free tips. And all you have to do is look it over, get familiar with what's valuable, what's junk. And even though when you're standing in the middle of the store, you can do some uh, researching on your phone, sometimes it's good to just educate yourself ahead of time with knowing what's valuable and what's not so that you're saving yourself time when you're going to the store and you probably will get so good at knowing, okay, yeah, that's just a print that's probably not as valuable, or this is an oil painting. And because it's got these qualities, these features, I know that this is valuable. And I want this for my home. But you can download this for free, just click on the blog post down below. And you will in the show notes, and you will be able to download that. So tip number two, you have to know what's hiding inside. (laughs) So have you ever bought a piece of furniture and you later found out that something was hiding inside? Well, I actually did. And it, trust me, it was very disturbing. Thankfully, whatever I'd found, it wasn't alive. It actually looked like it was some old shed skins, like little shells of something. And I, I didn't know what it was. And I had like posted a picture of it. I put it on my Facebook page and I said, does anybody know what what this is? I don't know what this is. It was a mid-century modern dresser that I had picked up from the thrift store and Some people said, yeah, that looks like cockroach shells. And I'm like, what? Oh, just, I'm looking at the picture now and just looking at it, it's giving me the creepy crawlies. (laughs) And so there, no, there was no active cockroaches inside of this dresser, but just finding those shells and knowing that at some point there had been cockroaches in there was scary as heck. (laughs) And so I would tell you that whenever you're going to the thrift store, Make sure that you are properly checking something out. And when I mean checking it out, I'm talking about opening all the drawers, checking with a flashlight. You do have a flashlight on your phone, making sure that if you see anything in there, you know what it is before you put that thing inside of your vehicle. Because um, just imagine if you have something that's got a cockroach crawling around in it. Yeah, that's that's not going to be great bringing it into your car and then getting it into your house or even just putting it into your garage. So always do a thorough inspection before you bring something into your car. What I like to do is I actually like to keep a set of gloves. I like to keep a, uh, I would say maybe like a uh, spray, some kind of, you know, cleaning spray and just a roll of paper towels or napkins. And I will wipe something down, take all the drawers out, wipe it down and I've got a tarp that I leave in the back of my my van. And this is great for even when I'm hauling mulch. I did a lot of gardening stuff this week. And just hauling mulch, that stuff can get all over your, your car, your van. I wish I had a pickup truck, <laughs> but I don't. I have a minivan. And so I'll spread the tarp down just to prevent it from getting onto the floor of the car, of the van. And I do the same when I'm bringing something home from the, from the thrift store, the tarp always goes down. And so, you know, even if it's something that's creepy crawly and I miss it, yeah, it can crawl on the tarp, but you would hope that it would have a lot more, uh, or I should say less cracks and crevices to fall into. (laughs) If you're just going from the thrift store to home, I'm not going to leave a piece of thrifted furniture or anything thrifted sitting in my car for an extended period of time. I just don't do it. You know, years ago, probably about two or three, I'll say three years ago, I had gone to Home Depot and got flowers and I was not ready to plant them that day. I was going to do it the next day. I left them in my car. Now, did I realize that I had a problem right away? No, didn't realize it until sometime later when I'm driving down the road and these bugs keep landing, flying and landing on me. And I'm like, what are these little bugs? Well, My van, (laughs) my van got infested with carpet beetles. Yes, little black carpet beetles. And I was freaking out. I thought, oh my gosh, how in the world did this happen? And the only thing that I could think of 
is that I had left cut flowers in my vehicle and cut flowers is where you can find carpet beetles. You know, they, they love cut flowers. So whenever you're transporting flowers home, don't leave them sitting in your car for an extended period of time. If you're going to do three stops, make Home Depot your last stop so that the amount of time between when you've got cut flowers in your home or in your car to getting them home, it'll be the shortest time. Don't just leave them in your car. So let me tell you, I had to tear everything out of my van. And when I say tear everything out, I mean down to the studs of my, the framing, the studs of my vehicle. And I had to get a couple of uh, insecticides and put all of that, just coated my entire vehicle with insecticides and it worked. And I vacuumed everything out and I found the infestation (laughs) like underneath of the seats and I was able to get all that out and never had a problem since. But that was flowers The same could be true for thrifted furniture or anything you find on the side of the road. Or let me just be clear, anything that you bring home from the store, it could be something that's already pre-packaged. I learned my lesson. I don't leave anything sitting in my van that I've brought from the store, whether it's packaged or not. I just don't leave it sitting in there because you just don't know what's in there. Even if it's just at a regular store, don't leave it sitting in there, especially something from the thrift store. All right, so that's tip number two. Thoroughly know what's hiding inside. And I guess I gave you some other tips. Use a tarp always and check it out thoroughly and don't leave it sitting in your car. Tip number three, know how soon you can wash it. Now I mentioned about clothing. I don't leave that sitting in the car. And the same is true if I buy something thrifted from the thrift store, just like a dress or something, which isn't that often. But when I do buy something I immediately come home, toss it in the washing machine, and if I can't get it home immediately, I just try to have it double bagged and, you know, seal it up. <laughs> or what might what might even be a good idea, too, is to have something in the back of your car, maybe uh, like one of those plastic containers, and you can't just have any plastic containers. I love the ones that are double sealed. It's like they've got I don't even know how to explain them, but they're specifically made for keeping bugs out. And I've got these in my basement. If you if you go to my video that I was talking about last week, the one where I redid my uh, utility room, you'll see the plastic containers that I have in there are the ones that have like six clips on them, like six clips to keep anything out. And it's got this gasket seal underneath of the lid. So when you close that up, you're shutting out anything that could get inside or outside. And I think it's valuable to put clothing or anything that's small into that. And especially again, if you know, well, I'm going to take that back. Not even if you can't wash it until later or clean it till later. I'm thinking I might even just put one back there just for transporting things home. (laughs) Because that way you're containing it and you're not risking having something fallen out into the cracks or crevice. But especially if you're if you're out and about, let's say you're traveling, I don't know, maybe you went two hours away somewhere and you saw a cool thrift store and you bought something. And again, you don't want it just in your car for any amount of time. If it's small enough, put it into one of those containers with the gasket seal, seal it up, and then when you can get it home, then you'll be able to deal with it. For things like rugs and upholstered furniture, I can tell you, I don't buy rugs at the thrift store. I would never, ever buy a rug at the thrift store. I just, I feel like there's too many cracks and crevices in the loops and the fibers for things to hide. Upholstered furniture, I have only ever bought maybe a couple things upholstered. Maybe three. Three that I can think of on the top of my my head. And one of them, what, and all of them, I should say, sat in the garage for gosh, God knows how long before I actually got to it. I didn't bring it immediately into my house. And one of the chairs that I did, the wingback chair, I had taken that thing down to like the frame. So if there was anything in there, I mean, it had been sitting in the garage for probably three years, if not more. But then if there was anything in there that later crawled in, it it would have gotten taken out anyway, because everything got stripped down to the bare frame. So 
Keep it outside if you can. You can try to steam clean it either yourself or professionally. If it's something that you're not going to reupholster, uh, try steam cleaning, maybe even professionally steam cleaning. And just be very careful. You don't want to bring something into your house. Upholstered furniture, I'm always like, mm. if you can pass it up, I'd pass it up. That There's just too many hiding spots for things to, to be hiding in there. So yeah. All right. Tip number four, know what tools to bring along to the thrift store. And, uh, you know, I, I would just say, ah, there's a lot of things that you can bring with you. I already mentioned some things like the gloves, the paper towels, the cleaner, but there's a couple other things that it might be helpful, especially if you like going to thrift stores often, is to just have a container in the back of your, your car that has some of these things like, you know, the flashlight, you can use the one on your phone, but if there's one that's, that is maybe a little bit more high powered or can really reach the flashlights on your phone, you, you can only go, but so far the, the, the light can shine, but so far, but get one that you can actually look back. Like once you take the drawers of the dresser out, you can actually shine it back there and you can see if there's anything back there. Scientific tweezers, <laughs> you know, like the long scientific tweezers that have the real long little needle nose. You can use those or just regular tweezers for picking up specimens. <laughs> that sounds really gross, doesn't it? Disposable gloves are great. Uh, bite baby wipes. Um, if you don't have a tarp, you can use an old blanket to cover the floor. But again, tarps are great because you can just shake it out. You can hose it off and then be done. Cotton swabs can be great for swabbing cracks and crevices. But oh, just thinking of having to do that just exhausts me. Doesn't it exhaust you? Like, I don't want to be even thinking of putting something in my van if I need to swab a crack or crevice. But <laughs> it's better to know that you have these little swabs if you need to do that, then by all means do it. A magnifying glass would be great for closer inspection. A handheld vacuum is is highly recommended for cleaning out furniture. You can do this even before you get it into your van. I will when I go to the thr thrift store, I will take out the drawers and just kind of just dump it out or even turn it over so that if there's any little pieces of dust inside, it'll kind of fall out. And also you can keep diatomaceous earth inside of your vehicle just a little bit. So you can kind of pump that inside and maybe an insecticide spray. Even if you don't see anything, it could be worth spraying it down before you get it into your van and a screwdriver set is good in case you have to like take something apart and, you know, squirt some stuff inside of there. Now, I know you may be thinking, if I got to go through all that, I am not going to the thrift store <laughs> looking for furniture, looking for items. I get it. It's It can be a lot, but just think about the value that you're getting from what you're buying. If you just have to spend a little bit of extra time, 15 minutes, maybe not even 15 minutes, inspecting this to just truly make sure it's it's good to go and ready to bring into your house, then it's worth it. It's worth the amount of money that you're saving. And again, you're, you're doing something great for the environment and you're getting a good deal and you're getting something that's probably more unique than the 10 that's sitting over, you know, on the shelf over there. I like the things that I put in my house to be unique. I don't want to walk in and see you know, artwork that there was a hundred of them sitting in the warehouse at Ikea. You know what I mean? Okay. Tip number five. Again, this is talking about knowing how to properly inspect things before lugging it home. And I, I talked a little bit about this, but here's what I like to tell you to do. Remove all the drawers and check the body, right? I already mentioned that. Have your flashlight Turn it over, and if you see any little cracks or crevices, check the holes, check the screw holes, and see if there's anything in there. You can pull back or cut the lining of the body of upholstered furniture. A lot of times when you get a upholstered chair, they'll have like a dust cover on the bottom. And I don't know if I mentioned this in the tools, but it probably would be helpful if you had maybe like a, like a Swiss Army knife or maybe even just a staple puller. So if you need to pull off the bottoms of a piece of furniture, you can easily do that. Just Or even just a screwdriver, like a flathead screwdriver, so you can pop out those screws. And or not the screws, sorry, the, uh, the staples. But look it over and just make sure it, it looks 
like there's nothing creepy. There's no shed skins of insects. You know, another insect that is pretty common in most homes are carpet beetles. Now I mentioned the black ones that I found in my vehicle. And that's how I knew that they were from flowers because I'd never seen black ones before. I do see the ones that are like multicolored. I get them in my house. They come out every spring. Like as soon as the weather turns warm, if you look in your window sills, you'll probably see one or two carpet beetles. They're, they're just, they're so common in most people's homes. And if you're not looking for them, you may not have even known that they were there. And when the uh, larvae, like, let's say, for example, you go to your closet and you pull out, um, I don't know, like a wool uh, hat or something, for example. Sorry, I got distracted. My <laughs> my AC unit here in the shed cut on and I got distracted for a moment. For a moment. Um, but if you pull out like a wool hat or a wool sweater, um, you might see that there are little, if you look closely, you'll see little shedded skins that look like little very, very tiny shells. Those are the the larvae of carpet beetles. They love wool. They love piles of clothing. I mean, you can find them pretty much anywhere. They'll get into anything looking for food. Um, Books. If you have a bookshelf, if you go onto your bookshelf and flip through some of your books, you might see the little skins of insects. I wouldn't be surprised if you see that when you're inspecting things before you bring them home. They're just so common. But again, you don't want to bring anything in. So look for the larvae. They're, they're small. They look like little small um, caterpillars. And when I say small, I mean probably like not, not a quarter of an inch, like maybe an eighth of an inch. They're so small. Um, but if you see those shedded skins, and that means you, like, for example, on the underside of furniture, carpet beetles love to hide out under there. If you pull that back and you see them, then it could be infested with carpet beetles or carpet beetle larvae. So that's maybe something that you would not want to bring into your house. So just get comfortable with inspecting things before you bring it home, knowing what you're getting into. All right, now that all that icky conversation is done, (laughs) let's talk about tip number six, knowing your dimensions, your trunk, your home, your rooms, because nothing sucks more than finding this great piece of furniture and then realizing, oh my gosh, wait a minute, I can't actually get this home. I don't know where I'm going to put this. I thought it was a great buy. It is a great buy, but I don't, I can't even put it anywhere. Okay. Sorry. I just had to get up and stop this recording and turn off my dehumidifier. It was my dehumidifier that actually cut on. And I realized, wait a minute, that's pretty loud. You're probably going to be able to hear that in the background. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay. Back to number six, knowing your dimensions. So when you find this great piece of furniture or item, You want to know how you're going to be able to get it home. Your trunk may be too small, but you got to get it home somehow. So what I would do is make sure that you know what the size of your trunk is. Take a tape measure and measure the dimensions of your trunk. And that way you'll know when you see something out in the streets, (laughs) whether it's roadside, whether it's thrift store, whether it's just a regular store, you can pull up your phone, maybe pull up an email that you've sent to yourself or a text message you'd sent and saved and look at your dimensions and then take the dimensions. If you have a tape measure, I'll tell you, here's a great tip. If you can find, you may have to buy this, but I go to conferences and they, they tend to hand these things out. Uh, I went to the national hardware show back in January and they gave me this little tape measure. That's a key ring. And it's great because I have it on my key ring. So whenever I need to measure something, I can just take out my keys and it's there. You can probably find it online for just a couple dollars, but take your tape measure and measure to see if that item that you found is actually going to fit in your trunk. That's going to tell you whether or not you can afford to pot to buy this, or let's say you find a really great dresser. You're not sure if it's going to fit in your trunk and it's a pretty good deal. But then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I actually need to rent a truck (laughs) to come and get this thing in order to get it home. Well, maybe you can go to Home Depot and get a one hour truck rental for 20 bucks, maybe. It's not very expensive. And then add that to the cost of what it would be for the dresser and decide if this is something that you want to go through. The hassle of bringing this thing onto the rented truck, getting it home, 
Or maybe you have a friend that has a truck that can do you a solid, do you a favor and help you get it home. But if you know these things up front, then it kind of saves you the the stress of figuring out, oh my gosh, should I buy this thing? I don't know if I should buy it. Is it going to fit? Where am I going to put it? So know your measurements, your trunk, know your home measurements, have an email where maybe you send all of your measurements. This is why I like to, um, I, well, I'll put it this way. I like the idea of having a home journal. And I've thought about creating something like this and, and being able to sell it. Now there are home journals out there, but I won't go down that road. Anyway, let me just say, <laughs> know all of your measurements. One afternoon when you don't have much going on, take your measurements. Take the measurements of your house. Take the measurements of your door frames. Because even though you may like something, is it going to fit through your doorway? You may have a refrigerator that you want to purchase and you didn't think, oh, I've got to get it through the doorway in order to get it into my kitchen. And you would think that companies would kind of build that into the, the the design of whatever it is that they're selling, but you might have an older home. Older homes, I know I have some doorways in my home that it's definitely not 36 inches. <laughs> they might be a little bit more narrow. And if you've got a modern home, then I think a lot of times homes now are built knowing that, okay, you've got to get furniture through here. You've got to be able to move things around and shimmy it through this door and up the stairs. And it's a little easier. But if you've got an older home, you may not have that that privilege of knowing that things are just going to fit. So definitely take all your measurements. What I like to do is I like to send an email to myself or a text message. Text message is great because then I can just pull it up and say, oh, okay, here's a list of all my measurements. And I know whether something, whether or not something's going to fit. So that's, there you go. That's your tip number six. Tip number seven is to know thy thrifted self. Because you might be one of those hoarders that likes to store up projects that have so much potential. And then you get overwhelmed and you end up doing none of them. Is that you? Raise your hand. Because <laughs> that was me in the past. It's still kind of me. I've gotten a little better over the years. But I knew that I had more excitement about doing the projects that I was seeing than actual time to do the project. So before you even hit the thrift store, you have to know this about yourself. You know, you might be someone who just gets really excited about the prospects of all this great stuff that you can refinish, but then you, you, you should know that you don't really have the time to do all that. You might only have time to complete one project over a, a two month time period. <laughs> so in that case, you know, ideally you only have enough time to do six projects for the year. And that's, well, let's say if it's, let's say if you're once every two months, you get enough time, you can't do any more than six projects. And that's if you're working consistently. And if you know that about yourself, then you can kind of pull yourself back a little when you get that excitement and you're like, Oh, I can do this. Look at this great piece of furniture. No, calm down. You've already got three pieces at home. You don't have any more space to store it. You don't have any more time on your plate to take on one more project. And it's hard. I mean, there's, I don't go to the thrift store as much as I used to because I don't have as much of a need. I have probably more of a need to clear out some of the things in my home <laughs> because over the years, it's just, it's just grown. And now I feel like I, I want to donate more than I want to bring in, but don't get it twisted. When I go to the thrift store, I find things all the time that I'm like, ooh, oh man, this would be really great. This would be a fun project. And for me, I could do the project and then donate it. Like you don't have to keep it for yourself. You can donate it to someone in need. You can, for example, get something from Habitat for Humanity and then you can donate it back to them. I mean, that is a great way to support them twice. You're buying the dresser, you're refinishing it to make it look amazing, and then you're donating it back to them so that they can sell it and make a profit off of it twice. So that's a great idea. If you're if you're really excited about something, but you're like, I don't really have a need for this, but I really want to make it over, just don't go crazy with getting too much stuff. Know yourself and know how much time you really have to work on things and know how much space you really have to store things 
before you just start bringing a lot of stuff in. And tip number eight is know the difference between valuable and desirable. So we already talked about knowing the value of something in tip one, but just because something is valuable doesn't mean it's desirable. So think about that that for a minute. Like, you know, just because those little figurines that you bought from the thrift store for $2 and maybe you researched it and you found, oh my gosh, these things are actually worth $75. That doesn't mean that someone should buy them. It just means that, okay, they're valuable, but is it valuable to you? (laughs) So, you know, if you're selling these things at like an Etsy shop or something, then great, you can make a lot of money off of that. But if you're just buying it because, wow, these things are $75, these things are worth $75. Don't do it if it's just going to be something that sits on your shelf and you don't value them. You don't desire them. You don't really appreciate them. And this has happened to me time and time again, times when I've gone to the thrift store on 50% off days and I've seen things and I'm like, whoa, these are some awesome shoes. I know these shoes cost at least $150 because I retailed them and I got them for only $10. Well, just because they were valuable doesn't mean that they were desirable. (laughs) Because if you're trying to sell it, maybe people don't really want it. Maybe it's just not, maybe it's not really sellable and it's not valuable to you because you just bought it because it was a good deal. You know, I bought, I think I told you the story before, I bought a vintage Victrola, right? Like one of those, um, uh, what do you call it? The record players, those old record players. Victrola, I think is the brand name. And I may have paid about $150 for it, I think. That was, at the time, that was the most that I'd ever spent at the thrift store. And I lugged this thing home. It was so heavy. And the only reason I bought it is because when I looked these up online, oh my gosh, these things sell for like $350. So because it was $350 and I was finding it for $150, wow, this is a great deal. I'm going to buy this. Do you know that that Victrola sat in my garage for years. I didn't know where I was going to put it. I didn't have a desire for it. I just bought it because I couldn't believe that this 300, actually, no, it was $400. I saw on eBay, $400. I couldn't believe that this $400 thing was actually only, quote unquote, only $150, but it didn't have any valuable, any, any value to me. It wasn't desirable. And so I just kept it in the garage the entire time until finally I decided to donate it back to the thrift store. And it was just such a waste of money. So don't do that to yourself when you go to the store and you see something that whether you looked it up and you knew it was valuable or it was more expensive online and you found it at a deal, don't buy it just because of that. Buy it because there is a need for it or because you just really, really love this thing. And even if it wasn't $2, and it's worth 75, you would still buy it even if it was like $50 because you just love it. Buy it because you love it, not because you think that you got a great deal. Because in in other words, you're going to spend a lot of money that you didn't need to spot, you didn't need to spend. Okay, tip number seven, know the meaning of true love. (laughs) And that's what I mean when I'm talking about finding those things that you absolutely love, those special pieces that you find that just make you gasp. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they're selling this. That's how I felt about my vintage drafting table that I had refinished some time ago. I'll leave a link down below so you can see that. But I found it at the thrift store for $30. It was $60. It was a 50% off day. I could not believe this beautiful vintage table was $30. It is my, my, it's my most prized possession. I've since refinished it. I didn't paint it. I did refinish it and it looked fantastic. And I would never, ever part with this for $30. It, you know, it could have been probably 150 and I would have bought it because it was that valuable to me. So find those things that you truly love that make you gasp and you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I found this. Buy those things and not the other things that say, you know, well, here it's worth 75 and now it's worth $5. Let me buy it at five because it's a good deal. No, don't, don't, don't buy those things. Tip number 10 is to know your own vision. And I think this is the hardest thing because when you're buying things that you see online, 
that you know are are popular, right? Like, let's say Victrolas <laughs> are super popular and you're seeing them everywhere. And then you see one and you're like, wow, there's a Victrola. But if it's not your style, don't buy it. Just because you see blogs and Pinterest uh, posts talking about this particular item, don't buy it just because you're trying to fit into somebody else's vision of, of what a home should look like. Buy the things that speak to you, even if it's not something that's in style. That That's not really important. Get what you love, make sure it passes your true love test, and don't waste your time trying to imitate somebody else's vision. I know there are many a times I bought different chairs at the thrift store just because I had seen people making over these types of chairs online. And I'm like, wow, I saw those chairs. I saw some girl did a great, a great project with these chairs. I'll get these chairs too. And then I got them and I'm like, yeah, but that's not really my style. I don't think I really like that. I don't know where I'm going to put that in my house. So if you try to know your own vision, even if it's difficult for you to think what your own vision is, tip number nine will really help you figure it out. That's that true love test. Those things that make you gasp and say, oh, I like that. Go with those things and all the other things, don't even bother with them. So the last thing I want to talk about real quick before we end this podcast is Earth Day and the things that we can do to hopefully help the environment. I'll be honest with you, I'm generally a an optimist, generally. <laughs> I really like the idea that with positive thought, everything's going to be okay. You know, everything's going to work itself out in the end. And I'm just hearing so many things in the news about different storms that are going on and how the ice caps are melting at an incredible rate. And it just feels overwhelming. It just feels like, how do I tie the things that I'm doing into making an impact on these bigger things that are happening? Of course, it's all related, right? It's not just me. It's it's me collectively with everybody, everybody doing these things that have caused the ice caps to melt. And in South Sudan, there's this huge amount of flooding that's happening right now. I saw it on ABC News a couple of days ago. I'll leave a link down below. It's a fascinating segment. I think you should watch it. It brought tears to my eyes because of the flooding that's going on and the amount of people that, especially children, that are that are literally... Um, not having enough food to eat, like they're starving. And what really got me is when they showed the moms of these these small little babies that are, I mean, they are just so skinny and malnourished. These moms, the only thing that they can feed their babies are water lilies, literally water lilies. And I don't even know how much nutritional value they have. Probably, I mean, none, there's no protein, there's, there's nothing. And these mothers are rooting for water lilies in this flooding because that's that's it. They're 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 cut off from the rest of, you know, like basically all the farmland that they used to farm for food and, you know, the animals that that could eat the the crops and they could cut the, you know, kill the animals for protein. Like it's all gone. Even there was you'll see in the segment there's a group there was a group of cows that were literally standing on a uh shallow area of the water and they could, they couldn't go anywhere. So they were starving. The cows were literally starving, standing on this little bank in the middle of the water. And when you see this, you're like, oh my gosh, this is impossible. It seems like it's impossible. Like everything that's going on in the world with the storms, the, um, the ice caps melting, it just seems impossible to, to, go in the other direction. And I don't know where we go from here. I know, you know, that we we all collectively can can do the things that will I don't know collectively make it make a difference. I mean, if we're shopping thrift stores, right? Like let's think about this for a second. If we're shopping thrift stores, then the cost associated with buying new we're not contributing to that. I want you to go back and listen to, I believe it's episode two. I'll link to it down below. I had interviewed um, a woman named Marate 
um, Marate Kaveri, Kaveri Marate, I think her name was, Kaveri. And she had a really great interview telling us about the cost of, of buying new. When you're buying new clothing, we don't think about the water that it takes to grow that cotton. We don't think about the impact on the people who are there harvesting the cotton. We don't think about the environmental impact of getting all that cotton shipped to a different location. All that stuff is incurred when when we shop new, right? So I think by shopping thrift stores, we are making an effort to cut down on those. But, you know, are we such a small subset of the population that are willing to shop thrift stores um, that will it even make a difference? Will it even make a difference? I don't know. I don't know. And but but what I do know is that we can't just throw our hand throw our hands up and say, well, I don't really know how much of an impact this is going to have, so I'm just not going to do it. We have to keep moving forward and doing the things and talking to to people about things that they could do as well. And so I looked up some I looked up an article and it was talking about Earth Day 2023, which was yesterday. But again, it's not just one day. This should be every day we're thinking about Earth Day. And I wanted to just go through a couple of things that this article pointed out that collectively, if we all do this, maybe it will make a difference, such as cleaning up your neighborhood, right? And you think about the the trash that we just toss something on the ground, it gets sent down, uh, you know, down the stream, and then suddenly it ends up in the ocean, right? So if we clean up our neighborhood, then maybe we can help make an impact in that kind of way. And you know, it's great. There's a couple of women in my neighborhood that when I see them running in the morning, I don't see them all the time. It depends on what time I go running. I love these two women. You know why? Because when they go for their walk, they actually take a plastic bag and they pick up trash on their, on their walk route. And I noticed that one day and I was like, you guys are actually picking up trash. And they're like, yeah, we, you know, we just bring a bag along. And I told them, I said, thank you so much. Like I wanted to even just publicly on the next door app, Take, take take their picture and just say thank you to these two women for making an effort to clean up as they go out for their walk. So that's an idea that you can do next time when you're out on a walk, take a plastic bag with you and, you know, maybe a uh, disposable glove or something like that. Or maybe one of those, those, I love those little trash. You ever see those little trash things? I, I had one when I was a kid, <laughs> you know, you squeeze the trigger and the little arm the, the little arm claw. Maybe if you have one of those, you can easily just pick up trash so you don't have to use your hands or a disposable glove, right? And um, you could walk around your neighborhood and pick up trash. I think that would be a great idea. Or I'm thinking I might even get my kids to do that. That would be a great op- opportunity for them as well. So that's an opportunity for um, what we could do for Earth Day or Earth Week, Earth Year. Another thing is going meatless. Now, I'm a vegetarian. I've been one for 23, 24 years. Um, When people ask me, oh, why are you a vegetarian? I do tell them that there are some dietary things that I I don't care for about meat. I have good substitutes. But when I think about the environmental impact of the methane, because cattle, pigs, all of these animals do produce um, a significant amount of methane, according to this article. And then that acts as a greenhouse gas. So this article recommends cutting back on meat. Maybe you have meatless Monday. I mean, if more people go meatless, then maybe there's less need for less animals, less animals, less methane. That's the idea. Now, whether people are going to do this, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know how much of an impact that will have, but there you go. Unplugging your devices for the day. And this is something I'm actually doing with, with, with my kids today as we speak. Today is a Sunday. They spend too much time on electronics. And that's literally just all day draining this electricity to play video games. And a large majority of the energy that powers our homes comes directly from fossil fuels. So going forward on Sundays, I'm going to have Sundays be very limited video game playing. Just get a couple hours in the morning and then we're going to be using the rest of the day to study, maybe go for uh, walks, maybe picking up trash, maybe doing some of these things that they would be better, that would be better served with their time than just playing video games all day. 
planting a tree. You can plant a tree in your backyard. Um, I I actually think I want to plant a tree. I, I, I love the idea of planting fruit trees. I have a persimmons that I planted in the back of my shed. Doesn't get a lot of light back there. So it's growing very, very slowly. It's still just basically a stick coming up out of the ground. But I did see a couple buds on it. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> but planting a tree, I'm thinking of maybe even getting a cherry tree and planting that in the middle of my yard. We'll see. And just limiting your shower time to less than eight minutes is what they recommend. I know sometimes I can get in there and I, I can be in there for 10 minutes, but set your timer on your phone and see if that makes a difference in, you know, even just your water bill, how much water you use. Now, where you live might be different than where I live. Here in Maryland, they charge five cents for plastic bags. I hate getting plastic bags at the store, so I try to avoid it at all costs. And I have started, like, even making my own reusable bags. Uh, just think of all the, if you're someone who likes to sew, think of all the fabric that you have probably lying around. You could you could easily use some of that fabric and make shopping bags. And I, I did. I made one <laughs> recently, a few months ago, and I'm thinking of making more because out of all the bags that I have, that's the strongest. And I felt really good about making my own bag. And it, I, I think I did follow a pattern. I'll see if I can find a link and leave that down below. Um, also to try not to buy disposable water bottles. When I go to Costco, Oh, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me. It just, er, it's irritating when I see people just buying these big bulks of plastic bottle, like water bottles. I hate it. I just want to say, can you just go get one big one and go fill it up somewhere? <laughs> so that does bother me. But I know that one thing that I've done that's really good is that, and this is something that you you have to have money for. So, you know, if you don't have money for this, then... I understand, but I actually had a water filtration system put in my kitchen. It was expensive. It was like $2,000. And I know most people are not going to have money for that. I did it because we were a family of five and I kept going to the store, filling up those five gallon bottles. And I'd literally be at the store every, every three days because we would go through them. I, I had two of them. We'd go through 10 gallons easily within a few days and I found myself going back and forth to the store, back and forth, back and forth. And that's a lot of gas. That's a lot of time. It's extra money I'd spend because if I'm at the store, may as well pick up a few other things. So now all we have to do is change the filters about every five or six months. And we just fill up the containers here. We have a three gallon. We fill that up, put that in the refrigerator, and it's drastically reduced the amount of times I've been having to go to the store to do that. So you might want to think about that. If you have the income to do it, uh, it's it's a great way to have filtered water and so nice clean water without all the chemicals in it and then not have to go and, and buy the reusable bottles. But anyway, if you want to look it up, it's called, uh, I think it's Martin Water, Martin Water Filtration. And I'll leave a link below for that too. All right, uh, buy in bulk food to reduce your use of plastic containers. If you have a Costco, Sam's Club, you know, even those containers, sometimes I'm like, why do they have to put so much like plastic and wrapping around these? But companies are getting, they're getting a little smarter. I know Beyond Meat recently in the last year made a change where their uh, containers their packaging has gotten a lot, a lot better. I used to com complain. I'm like, how do you have veggie burgers that's supposed to be better for the environment, but you have all this plastic wrap <laughs> in these plastic containers? So they're, they're getting, they're getting better, but I think there's still, there's still room for them to improve. And then just recycling more, repairing things instead of replacing it. And they also recommend starting a composting pile, which I don't have. I need to actually maybe consider getting a composting bin. Or making one. Uh, but I like the idea of repairing instead of replacing because there's so many things that the minute we get a hole in it, it's not it's not useful anymore. So if you know how to sew, you can easily sew up a seam, take it to a seamstress. If you don't have one, get a family member to do it. And let's see if we can start reusing things more often. Every day when I run, when it's cold, if it's cold, we've had some weird mornings, I will wear a pair of gloves and the, the gloves that I wear, 
has a big hole <laughs> in one of the fingers. And every time I'm like, I'm going to get, I'm just going to throw these out and get a new pair of gloves. And I thought, Serena, you know how to sew, just sew it up. Like it's not that hard to do. So I'm starting to try to make sure that I'm thinking of the repairs that I can make, <laughs> even to clothing and holes and socks, instead of replacing these things. But in the end, is it going to matter? I don't know. I think the earth will take care of itself. It's the earth. Come on, we're not, we're not like, we can't possibly kill the earth. I think if anything, the earth can kill us. So I think we have to worry more about our humanity and our survival than the planet because the planet's going to come back. I mean, look, the planet's all, already been telling you, we don't care about your home. We can send a tornado through here. We can send flooding. And you're the one that has to worry, not us. And I do believe that that's true. Earth is so much bigger and more powerful than we are. And I think if we want to survive, we all have to make these changes. And it feels overwhelming because if we're all not doing it, what impact are we really going to have? And even if that's the case, I, I, I can't be that person that says, well, nobody else is doing it, so I'm not going to do it either. We all have to do it. And if nobody else is going to do it, we still have to do it ourselves. So maybe think about your own things that you can do moving forward in order to uh, observe Earth Day, Earth Week, Earth Year, and think about that. I'm going to think about some other things that I can do as well. Um, and if you want to send them to me, let me know. What are you going to do in order to become more environmentally friendly? Are you going to try Meatless Mondays? Do you already try Meatless Mondays? <laughs> If you want to talk to me about vegetarianism and some vegan meals, let me know. My husband is an amazing cook. I don't really like to cook. He's an amazing cook, and I can share with you some things that, that he makes that are really good and flavorful, and that can help you on your Meatless Mondays. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Come back again. I'm still trying to get my friend to come onto the show so that we can talk about scams and how to avoid them with your home with your love life. She is an expert because she was scammed out of thousands of dollars in a romance scam. And she wrote an entire book about how to avoid scams. And this is actually pretty important because people can scam you out of your home too. So we're going to talk about all those things. I just sent her another message the other day. Hey, when are we going to do this Zoom conversation. So that will be coming up, I promise you. That's a conversation that I want to have. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy your week. And I will see you next episode. Diving. Find it ugly, make it pretty. Mm -hmm. Paint a power tools, all right. Saving money.